Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning and to welcome you to this worship hour at Roebuck Baptist Church. We're delighted that you're here and we look forward to what God's going to do in our midst this morning. Uh, so thanks again for your presence. If you're a guest today, we're so pleased that you're here. Thank you for taking your time to be with us this morning. And I will, I will mention this. On your bulletin, there's a little tear-off section on the right side as you open your bulletin. And it's got some questions there, some information things. If you are a guest and would like to leave us your information, we would love to have that. Uh, certainly you don't have to. We'd love to have that. There's also a place there for prayer requests or comments. And anyone, member, guest, anyone is welcome to uh, fill that out. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Well, what I'm going to do in just a moment, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And then after I finish praying, we're going to have our first worship song. And our custom is that during the song, uh, David Satterwhite, our minister of music, will lead us in a portion of the song. And then he will give us some instructions about we're going to have a little time of fellowship. So he'll uh, tell us what to do about greeting those that are nearby. So... The first thing that I want to do is lead us in prayer, but as soon as we finish praying, I'm going to ask you to stand. So let's go ahead and pray together as we begin and uh, prepare our hearts for worship. Father, thank you so much for this great opportunity. Thank you for everyone who's here. And we do pray that you would be glorified and honored in all that's done. I pray that as we fellowship together, as we sing together, as we give, as we hear your word read, as we hear it proclaimed in all that we do, I just pray that you truly would have your will and your way in our hearts and lives and that you would be glorified. So we commit this time to you. We thank you for it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together as we continue our worship. Hallelujah. What a Savior.
Savior we have, Jesus Christ. Think about that. I think about um, how without Christ, I would have nothing. Not just I wouldn't have salvation, but I wouldn't have a life. I don't, I don't see how people go through life without Jesus in their life. You may, have, you may have become a Christian as an adult and said, yeah, I was lost, but now I'm a different person. This is, this is what uh, Paul tells us in Romans. He says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All of us are sinners. All of us need a Savior, and Jesus is our Savior. And our job is just to tell the world about it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's do it. When I survey that wondrous cross, it makes me want to give all back to Him. When I survey
He didn't leave us alone. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is on. Thank you for that song. Lord, help us to long for your presence, to live in the experience of the goodness of your glory, God. I'm not really sure that's something we think about enough. I'm sure that's something we long enough for. And God, I pray for that, Lord. I pray that we will long to be in your presence. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the fact that, Lord, when we believe that you loved us so much that you sent your son and down the cross for our sins and raised him from the dead three days later god that we experience life and you send the holy spirit into our life to lead us to guide us to indwell in us and lord i pray that we will see that i pray that we will live that out 
Well, I thank you for that. I, I pray, Lord, just this morning for just, I think about the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, I just pray for peace this morning. That you'll, you'll give us a, a, a peace. Whatever we're wrestling with in our hearts, whatever we're wrestling with on a daily basis, God, I pray that you will stand strong in the midst of it and that you will give us peace. Lord, help us experience your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we come to pray today, we need to pray for the family of Keith Hyatt. <clears throat> Keith lost his brother Ray uh, to uh, cancer this week, and his funeral is this afternoon at 3 o'clock at Green Lawn, Lloyd's Green Lawn Chapel. So let's pray for that family. Let's go to the Lord together as we pray. Father, we come today to raise a hallelujah, to say praise to you. You are worthy of our praise, and we come to just offer it to you. You bless us in so many ways, and we miss so many of those blessings because we're not in tune with you. We're not in step with you. We get bogged down. We get distracted. All the pressures of life sometimes seem to be caving in on us, and sometimes we just forget that you are the God who is worthy of our praise, and you're always with us in the middle of the storm, as they've just sung. You're always with us, and you're there to bring us through, and so we give you thanks and praise for that today. I thank you again for this great opportunity. We don't have enough of these opportunities to come together as your people the people of Roebuck Baptist Church and friends and others, and we come together today to simply say thank you and to just bless your name and to offer our lives back to you. And I pray that in all that's done in these next few moments, I pray you'd be honored, glorified, uplifted, and people would know that they've been in your presence. I would know that. All of us would know that as we leave this place this morning. So we just thank you for this great opportunity and praise you for who you are and all you do. We do pray for the Hyatt family and the loss of uh, Keith's brother, Ray. We pray for other families. There have been, there have been other deaths, extended family uh, issues, and people who are in the hospital and going through treatments and operations and all kinds of situations. You know about them all. And we lift them before you and pray your special blessing upon each one. And again, we thank you for this opportunity. I'm thankful for everyone who's here. And I pray that you would be glorified in each life and in our midst. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. We are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, starting at verse 10 today. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You may be seated. I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily
And thank you, Dave and Amy. <laughs> what a challenging, challenging song. I think if I wrote it, I'd probably say, I surrender part. But we're supposed to surrender all, aren't we? Thank you, Dave. Uh, the word stand is found in this version of the Bible, the New American Standard, which is the best translation of the Bible. <laughs> It's found 269 times. It's found three times in the passage, the chapter that we're in right now, in Ephesians chapter 6, only one of which is in our text for this morning. But if you think about the word stand, I just started thinking about how many different meanings in our language that this word has. It has it's, a, it's, a, it's a verb, it's a noun. It's used in so many different ways. For instance, in, in weddings, it's common for the groom to have some friends to come and be part of his wedding party. They're his groomsmen, so they say, and they'll say this. Uh, they'll, they'll put it like this. He's, he's standing for the groom. And uh, so that's one way. And then even at a wedding rehearsal, a lot of times, this is a traditional thing, when you go through the paces of the rehearsal, a lot of times someone stands in for the bride. It's supposed to be good luck or something. And then there are just so many other uh, uses. In, in Britain, for instance, here in America we call it running for office. And it just seems like everybody's always running and running and running and running and running for office. In Britain they say that they are standing for office. Maybe if we use that nomenclature, maybe things would get better over here. I don't know. But in Britain, they stand for office. At ball games, people sit in grandstands. Isn't that interesting? You sit in a grandstand. We put microphones on mic stands like that. Um, we put chair or we put uh, t lamps and books on nightstands. Kids sell refreshing summer drinks at lemonade stands. John White, who founded the Beacon, Kenny, used to refer to it as a hot dog stand. And the list just goes on and on. Uh, some guy named George uh, Armstrong Custer took a last stand, and it didn't work out too well for him. When you're given possible status to get on an airplane, you're said to be on standby. And that's really true. I was on standby one time, and I had to, I had to wait through three flights to finally get a seat. But I was on standby a long time. Sometimes, if there's something we don't like, we'll say like this, I cannot stand the taste of chocolate. Nobody ever said that, but you get the idea. Uh, Maria Bates sent a little uh, Valentine's poem to Ryan and me this week, uh, knowing that I do like the taste of chocolate. By the way, Ryan also does, but she also likes other things that I don't like. But this was Maria's little, I don't, I, I don't know if you made this up or not. You may not have made it up. Roses are red. I don't eat kale. The real holidays tomorrow when the candy's on sale. So there you go. So nobody ever said, I can't stand chocolate. You might say, I can't stand the taste of this, or I can't stand when it rains, or whatever. So there's another use. And then there, there's just the standing of respect. A gentleman is supposed to stand when a lady enters the room. Everyone stands when the judge enters the courthouse. And there are all kinds of examples of that kind of standing that goes on. But in this passage, Paul is dealing with the subject of spiritual warfare. And so he's dealing with this issue, we, we often call it, and that's why Custer made his last stand at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But that's what, that's what Paul is reminding us as believers, as Christians, that there is a battle being waged and that we have the responsibility of making our stand spiritually in warfare. And so this week and next, I couldn't get it in all in one sermon. This week and next, we're going to be dealing with this topic, but today I just simply chose the title, Stand, because that's what Paul tells us to do, that spiritually, spiritually speaking, when it comes to spiritual warfare, we have to stand. We have to stand up. We have to be counted. And that's what this passage is about. So we're going to look at it and just consider these verses one by one. First, in verse 10, where it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We're going to talk about the strength to stand. It takes strength to stand. And I probably should have, if I was a little bit more uh, technologically savvy, I would have played this clip. But in the movie Pearl Harbor, 
There's a fascinating little scene where after the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941, President Roosevelt, who was, had been stricken with polio and was in a wheelchair and had braces on his legs, is talking to his defense team about a strategic plan to get back at the Japanese by bombing them. And he's talking to his defense team, and they're all basically saying, these military guys saying, it can't be done. We can't get close enough to Japan. We'd have to get within 100 miles of Japan. It would put our, our Navy, at our, our battleships, at, um, aircraft carriers be in a position of vulnerability. We can't afford to lose them. And he just kept trying to get their attention to say, we can do this, we can do this. And finally, he just had had enough. And in the movie... Uh, FDR is played by the actor John Voight. There's this dramatic scene where he, at the head of the table, sitting in his wheelchair, backs his wheelchair away from the table, and it, with all the pain and, and struggle that you can imagine from someone who has braces on his legs, who has been inflicted with polio, he struggles and struggles, and, and the people come to help him, and he pushes them away, and on his own, he finally gets to his feet, and he looks at his military advisors, and he says, don't tell me it can't be done. And within three months, the Doolittle Raiders flew off of the aircraft carriers in the Pacific Ocean into Japan and bombed Tokyo. And even though it wasn't nearly as devastating and a, uh, a, a loss for the Japanese as, as our losses were in Pearl Harbor, it was a psychological victory. It raised the morale not only of the United States but also the Allies who early on were taking it hard from both Germany and Japan. And that scene represents what I think about when I think about the need for us to have strength to stand. We have to have strength to stand against Satan, even when it's hard. And by the way, I just want to emphasize something. I guess you could say I'm an educated person. I'm a graduate of Spartanburg High School, class of 74. I graduated from Wofford College, class of 77. I went, to, I went through Wofford in three years. I was trying to catch up with Ryan, a much older woman. I was trying to catch up with her. And then I went, I have two degrees from Southwestern Seminary. Serve on the board now as trustees at Southwestern Seminary. And I would, I would, I mean, I'm an educated person. And I just need to say, in our sophisticated, educated world, I believe in the existence of a devil. I believe that Satan is alive and well. And I don't have any, I don't make any bones about that. I believe that absolutely. And here Paul is talking about how it's important for us to be strong, not in our own strength, but in the Lord, in the strength of His might. I like the way uh, one translation puts it, find your strength in the Lord. The question then is how? How do we find our strength in the Lord? What do we do? Well, there are all kinds of answers to that. And Paul gives one of the best in that very famous story in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul has had this amazing, amazing experience where he goes into the second heaven and he, he's, all these great revelations are made to him. And it's just, he basically says, it's indescribable. It's something I never thought I'd see and something I don't think anyone would understand. And he said, because of the, of the greatness of those revelations, to keep me from exalting myself, there has been given to me a thorn in the flesh from, from, from Satan but also from God to keep me from exalting myself. And he says, I've prayed for this. I've prayed three times. And many translators believe or commentators believe that that represents the fact that he prayed many times for God to deliver him from this thorn in the flesh. But God doesn't deliver him from the thorn in the flesh. Instead, Paul says this in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12. He has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. And then he says, Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, when I am weak in myself, when I've come to the end of my energy and the end of my strength and the end of my abilities, I'm not strong myself, but I'm strong in Christ. And so that's what he tells us to do in Ephesians. We're to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There are so many examples of this. In Proverbs 28, the writer of Proverbs Solomon tells us that the wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous is as bold as a lion. God gives us boldness if we're walking in righteousness with him. 
memorizing scripture in Psalm 119. David says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Your word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness three times, he quoted scripture back to Satan three times. As if to say there's an answer to this. Satan said, here you've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself, feed everyone. And Jesus said, quoting from Deuteronomy, the word says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Two other times in the temptations, he quotes scripture back to, to the devil. And then just simply the idea of absolute trust. I love the story in Second Chronicles 20 when the Moabites and the Ammonites are aligned together against Judah and they're, they're marching to battle against Judah and Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah, and he realizes that they're outnumbered. There's no way they can win. And so he says, we don't know what to do, God, but our eyes are on you. We're trusting you. And that's how you gain strength. That's how you become strong in the Lord and in the strength of his mind. In Ephesians 3.20, the verse we've, we've studied, and uh, the group that used to meet on Wednesday night was named after this. That's where Paul says that, we, that God can do even... Uh, immeasurably more than anything we could ask or think according to the power that works within us. What's the power that works within us? It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts 1-8 before ascending, uh, just bef uh, before Pentecost, he said, you will receive power. The word is, is dunamis. It's the word from which we get dynamite. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. So we must be strong to stand. There, there's strength that comes from the, from the work of God in our lives. We must yield ourselves to Him. We must trust Him. We must focus on His Word. We must be diligent. We must be vigilant. We must be sober and alert because there is an adversary. So if we're going to, be, if we're going to stand, there needs to be strength to stand. And not only that, there needs to be stability to stand. Look at verse 11. He says, put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Stand firm. There, there's going to need to be stability. Not just stand, but to stand with steadfastness, to stand with endurance, to stand when the chips are down. A man who served as a missionary to Cuba was a professor at Southwestern Seminary when I was there. His name was David Fight. And I don't really know the arrangement. I researched this again just this week. He was a North American missionary along with his father-in-law, and they were stationed in Cuba in the mid-1960s, and there was tremendous pressure. Castro was already in power. Communism was reigning. There was a lot of pressure on the churches. So sure enough, in 1965, David Fight and his father-in-law were both arrested by the Cuban government, and the reason for their arrest, they were accused of ideological diversionism. In other words, they're preaching the gospel of a God that the communists said does not exist. And so they went through, he was in prison for three and a half years in Cuba. And it was a very arduous or, ordeal. It was a horrifying experience, as you can imagine. And he said one of the things that they used to do was they would march the prisoners. He was in with about 300 other people. Many of them were Cuban nationals. Many of them were Christians. Others were just political enemies of Castro. But they would march them out into the, into the sunshine, out into the, out into the yard, when the sun was just beaming down, that tropical sun of Cuba just beaming down on them, and they would just stand there for hours on end. And he said it was just, an, it was just an almost unbearable. And he said one day he was standing there, and they did this often, and he, they dreaded it so much, and it was just a tactic to beat them down. And he said, we're just standing there. And he said, and then I remembered, I remembered it was my birthday. And he remembered that on birthdays, Southern Baptist missionaries' names are listed in guide, uh, not guidepost, in uh, the devotional book and in other places in the missions magazines, etc. And he said, as I stood there in that sun just beating down on me and didn't think I could make it, I remembered that thousands and thousands of Southern Baptists all over the convention were praying by, by name for him that day because it was his birthday. And he said, God used that to just give him incredible strength and endurance and to recognize just the encouragement of knowing that he wasn't forgotten. And you may have prayed, on him that, prayed for him that day if you were around in 1965 or 66 and you prayed through those names. You may have prayed for Dr. David Fight 
And sure enough, he was eventually released, came back to the States, and as I said, was a professor at Southwestern Seminary. Well, this is just a reminder that we are to put on the full armor of God so that we may stand firm, that we may stand strong, that we may have stability to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, we're not going to talk about all the different pieces of God's armor today. We're going to do that next week. But God has provided for us spiritual weapons of warfare, defensive and offensive weapons. We're going to talk about those next week. I want to focus here on what he says when he says that we're to stand firm, put on full armor of God against the schemes of the devil. You see, this is, this is who we're up against. We're up against the deceiver. We're up against the one who schemes and plots and deceives to the bitter end. And that's exactly what Satan is doing today. And he's doing, he's very successful, by the way, at this. He appears as an angel of light. If, uh, an angel of light. In fact, it's interesting, Herschel Hobbes mentions that de the devil never appears to us like the devil. He appears to us in disguise. He appears to us in deceptive ways. But he always appears to God as Satan, as the devil. So God knows exactly who he is. He's got his eye fixed on him. And he uses him. We, we could go into some of the theology here. We're not going to do all that. But the bottom line is that the devil is a deceiver. He schemes against us. The King James Bible uses the word wiles. The wiles of the devil. I put a note by that. See coyotes. Just in case you're not paying attention. Okay, never mind. All right. My evangelism professor at Southwestern, Dr. Roy Fish, and I, I've shared this before. It's one of the most profound things that I learned in seminary, he said, you know, back in the 60s they had this, and it's back, but back in the 60s they had this thing, in fact, Time Magazine ran a cover uh, in the mid-60s, a, 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 a picture, no picture at all, just the headlines, God is dead. There was this God is dead movement. A lot of theologians were saying there is no God. It's proven by the fact that there's so much suffering in the world. It just goes on and on. And there were people who had adhered to the fact that not not only is there no Christian God or no Jewish God or no Muslim God, no God, there's no God, there's no such thing as God. And Dr. Fish said, I was never worried about the God is dead theology. In fact, he said when the God is dead theology reached its peak in the 1960s, more people believed in God than, that, than had believed in him before it actually began. But he said, I've never been afraid of God, of God is dead theology. But he said, I've always been concerned about the devil is dead theology. And that's where we are today. Some of the scholars, even the commentators that I read, use this as a, as a way of saying, you know, there's not really a devil. There's just this concept of evil, uh, the evil influence which seeks to make us sin, to drive us away from things that are good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And even though the Greek word here is diabolos, devil, one commentator translates it adversary, which is the Hebrew word for Satan. Satan's just really a, a, a word adversary. But that's not what it says. It says devil. The, de the devil is the one who is putting up these schemes. So what we do is we try to depersonalize the devil. Like two boys were walking home from church, and the pastor had just preached a, a message on Satan, and they were kind of shaken up and weren't sure what to think of it. And so one of the little boys said to the other, he says, what do you think about all this Satan stuff? And the little boy thought for me, he said, well, you know how Santa Claus turned out. It's probably just your dad. So there you go. I meant to use that last time I preached on fathers, but the bottom line is that's what we do. We try to de-personify uh, Satan, and that's, his, that's when he's at his wiliest. It's when he's deceiving us, convincing us that he doesn't exist. Listen, look at the world around us. The world around us is evidence, evidence after evidence of the existence of Satan. Now, we blame him for everything that we do wrong. We can't do that because he can't force himself on us. We make the decision to allow him to influence and deceive us and to do the things that we do. So it's not on him, but he's out there. He's active. As it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Satan prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And then in verse 9, it reminds us we're to resist him firm in our faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering the people Peter was writing to were experiencing great suffering, and Satan was involved, but he said, knowing that the, the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brothers who are in the world. We have to stand, and we have to stand firm. We have to stand with stability and endurance in order to win, to, to do what we're supposed to do in spiritual warfare. And then finally, 
verse 12 says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a struggle. The King James uses the word wrestle. That's really the better word. It means a, a hand-to-hand combat, man-to-man kind of combat. There's struggle in life. Max Lucado said life is more struggle than strut. It's more wrestling than resting. And most of you probably know that. In fact, some of you right now are probably embroiled in some, some tremendous suffering and struggle in your life. And maybe you don't have the answers. And maybe you look out at the future and you're thinking, how is this ever going to be resolved? Where, where, you know, Paul, Chuck, Chuck prayed this morning, we'd have peace. Where is that peace? So many times it seems like we can't find it. There's tribulation, there's, there's sickness, there's death, there's, you know, whatever those kinds of things are, family relationships, all of those pressures of life, jobs, money, all those things. Where's the peace? There's always struggle. And there truly is. And so here Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Very important. In fact, the King James says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I love the way the Phillips paraphrase put this. He says, we do not wrestle against any. Emphasis on any. Insert name here. We do not, re- we do not wrestle against any human person. It's not against... You know, we always think that this is this big battle and we're, we're wrestling against, you know, all these people who are against God. It's, no, our battle is not against people. It's not against flesh and blood. It is against these things that he lists, lists here. The rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, let me just, let me just say right off the bat, nobody knows how to delineate all these things perfectly. Some people might preach that way or teach that way. But it's not obvious what these things are referring to. The problem, the main thing that it's referring to is simply the unseen power that controls the dark world that's all around us. And we've talked about this and talked about this, and Paul talks about this often, 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's a positive side of this, but there's also this recognition that this warfare is going on all around us all the time. It never stops. It never ends. It's just out there, and it's a struggle. It is. Uh, It's literally the word from which we get the word agonize, and that's what it is. In this case, it's a physical agonizing, wrestling with these cosmic powers One commentator said the different labels do not imply four different classes of demonic beings. Each term simply views the forces arrayed against God and his people in a different way. The bottom line is 1 John 2, where John says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. And the world is passing away. So all those things, we can fall in love with the things of this world. We can fall in love with money or with power or with status or whatever the case. But the bottom line is that's not going to matter in the end. That's all passing away. And see, what, what we're talking about here, what Paul's talking about here, is there are forces at work that are ruling this unseen world, that are ruling. They're, they're luring us away from God. They're driving us away from God, dragging us away from God. And if we're not standing, and if we're not standing firm, and if we're not standing in the midst of this struggle and recognizing that we need God's power and we need God's strength, we're going to lose. It's serious stuff. And so here Paul is saying that we don't struggle against flesh and blood. We struggle against spiritual forces of wickedness. John Stott wrote this. He said, if we hope, if we hope to overcome these spiritual forces of wickedness, we need to bear in mind They have no moral principles. They have no code of honor. They have no higher feelings. They recognize no Geneva Convention to restrict or partially civilize the weapons of their warfare. They are utterly unscrupulous and ruthless in their pursuit of malicious designs. Remember what Jesus said when he compared himself to Satan. He said, the thief 
comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I want you to think about that. That's, that's a reference to Satan. He said, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. But the thief, Satan, and this is what he does. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. He comes to destroy. He's not just bothering, with, bothering you about your stuff. He's got higher intentions, or we might say lower intentions, stronger intentions. And we see it all. We see the path of destruction and death all around us in our culture. We see it all around us in our world. We see it when we think about things like abortion and sex trafficking. We think about all the corruption and all the evil. All those things that are out there that we read about in the paper every day. Children being capped, uh, kidnapped and killed. Just the whole thing, the whole mirage of all those things that we see that's just the barrage, not mirage, the barrage of all those things that we see all the time around us. Satan is working, and if we're not struggling, if we're not agonizing, if we're not wrestling, then we lose. So the struggle to stand is one we must face. It's, it's real. It's here. So the question for us this morning is this, are we standing? Are you standing? in spiritual warfare. Now, well, first of all, we, we must not be presumptuous. In Proverbs 13, it says, um, through presumption comes nothing but strife. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Paul says, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Don't get proud. Don't get cocky thinking, oh, well, you know, I've, I've been in discipleship now for two years, or I've been to the, to the Beth Moore Bible study, or you know, I've had this religious experience or I went to a concert and got all emotional about God. All those things are fine. Listen, the battle never ends. When you start thinking you're standing and you've got it all mastered, that's when you're most vulnerable. So don't be presumptuous. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This is serious business. Let me read the way the message paraphrases the end of this passage. It says, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish. That's what, we're, that's what we're in. That's what we're in. We're in a battle. We're in a war. It's a war for the souls of our children and grandchildren. It's a war, it's a war for our own souls. It's a war for the soul of the church. And you may be thinking, boy, Pastor, if you don't shut up pretty quick, I'm going to get so discouraged, I won't ever want to hear any of this again. Let me just remind you, here's the good news. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That's the thing we need to rely on. That's the thing we need to remember. And it's not, it's not even close. Satan is God's devil. Satan doesn't want God to use him. He doesn't want God... To, to work through him, but God does it all the time. And Satan is just foiled again and again and again, not by us, but by God. That's why Paul says we're to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Max Lucado wrote that Satan is to God what a mosquito is to an atomic bomb. This is not a close, this is like a dormant basketball game. This is not close, if you haven't paid attention. This is not close. There, he has no chance. He is a defeated foe. But God allows him to continue to work. He is alive and well. But we serve a God who is greater, and he is in us. So I put this question uh, on social media this morning, Facebook, and a quote from Nick Ripkin. Nick Ripkin was a pseudonym for a missionary who served in very, very trying places all over the world in the last couple of decades, and he wrote a book called The Insanity of God, and Andra Black turned me on to that book, and I thought, what a crazy title. It's one of the best books I've ever read. If you've never read The Insanity of God, I encourage you to read it. But in that book, Nick Ripkin asked the question, what is Satan's paramount intent? What's he up to? What are all these things that we read here in Ephesians 6 and all these other things that we're talking about, what is his main goal? What is his paramount goal? What is the top of the list? for Satan. And he answers it this way. Quite simply, it is this. Denying the world access to Jesus. Satan's greatest desire is for the people of this planet 
to leave Jesus alone. His greatest desire is for the people of this planet to leave Jesus alone. I agree with that. I agree with that because I believe all the things that he's doing as he seeks to break up families, as he seeks to break up marriages, as he seeks to get people involved in drugs and alcohol abuse, and as he does all the things that he does in, in corrupting people uh, through finances or whatever else, is all those things that he's ultimately what he's doing is he's trying to put an end to the gospel. He's trying to stop the message of the gospel of Jesus going forward. He's trying to keep people from hearing about Jesus, not just in faraway places where our missionaries are serving. He's trying to do that here in Roebuck and in Spartanburg and in so many places. Listen, I guarantee you, there are people that you know, at least casually, there are people that you know who do not know what the message of the gospel is because no one has ever clearly told them what it is. That's what Satan wants to do more than anything else. He wants to keep people away from Jesus. He wants losers. He wants lostness. That's what he's after. Chuck Swindoll (coughs) shares about a statement that was printed in one of the official documents that was distributed to the Nazi guards who were overseeing the death camps during World War II. And it's just a simple statement. The law of the camp is that those who are going to their death should be deceived until the end. The law of the camp is that those going to their death should be deceived until the end. That's that's a job description for Satan. He is the deceiver. And so, we hear again these words, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's where our struggle is. But take heart. Take heart. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that victory? Are you standing in spiritual warfare, standing firm, standing against the struggle in the midst of the struggle? That's what God's will is for your life. I pray that you will. I pray that I will. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you today that in the midst of this warfare, this this, uh, battle that's being waged constantly, that's, that's unseen, but it's always there, it's relentless because Satan is relentless. That's why you I believe that's why you gave Paul the impetus to write in Ephesians 4 that we're not to give the devil an opportunity because he's the most opportunistic being in the universe. So Father, I pray today, I pray for myself and I pray for all who hear my voice this day that as believers that we would be strong in you and in the strength of your might that we put on all the full armor that you've given that we might stand firm against the schemes of the devil because our battle is not against flesh and blood. So many times we get confused about that, but it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the, the, the rulers of this wicked darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness, those cosmic powers that we can't see in the heavenly places. And so, Father, help us to recognize that you are greater, you who are in us, are greater than Satan who is in the world. And you've given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And help us in the midst of that struggle to always recognize that we are on the winning side. And then we want all the world to know that Jesus is the winner, that Jesus makes all the difference. That Jesus is the difference between darkness and light. And we can stand in your strength and we, and we must stand in your strength and make known with all our beings to others what is the gospel message that you loved us so much you sent your son Jesus that we might have life and victory through him. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. We're going to have our hymn of response. And as we do, I just want to really encourage you to remember this is so important. And it's not something we talk about a lot. It's not something we talk about enough. 
And I'm not one of those guys that there's a demon behind every bush kind of thing or anything like that. But I know this, Satan is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Don't let it be you. Don't let it be your family. Stand. Stand firm. Stand in the midst of the struggle. Don't give up. The victory is yours in Christ. So if you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to do that. Satan doesn't want you to do that. But Jesus is there for you. He's reaching out his hand. He's knocking at the door. Will you open it? Let him come in. If you've never done that, I encourage you to just trust him. Admit your sin. Believe he's who he claims to be. And commit your life to him. Maybe you've done that. You've never made it public. Here's an opportunity to make it public. Maybe you've never gone through believer's baptism. Uh, We need to have believer's baptism more often. I'd love to have it every Sunday. In fact, I'd love to have it every day. So if you've never given your life, if you've never publicly professed your faith in Christ and followed him in believer's baptism, I urge you to do that. Maybe God's leading you into the membership of our church. We're going to have a song. I'm going to be here at the front. You come quickly. We're not going to belabor this. But you come as God leads. Let's stand together. Thank you so much. Would you be seated for just a moment? Mike and Kathy, you'll come up here and stand with me. Some of you may remember Mike and Kathy Kirkland. They were in this church for many years. They've been on sabbatical. <laughs> and they're coming back to us this morning on promise of letter from a sister church in our uh, Spartanburg County Baptist Network. And we're so delighted to have them come. You know, uh, there are a lot of Kirklands uh, in Roebuck. They're all related. So, uh, and a lot of them are members of our church, and we're just delighted to have Mike and Kathy. They're delightful people, and we're and and Mike said not only coming to move his membership back, but also to rededicate his life. And so, if you would welcome Mike and Kathy back to Roebuck, would you let it be known by saying Amen? Amen. 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 We're glad to have them back. God bless you. Amen. All right. Now, uh, Daniel Corley is our deacon of the week. As he's coming up, I want to remind you tonight. Um, I know a lot of you are in discipleship groups, and I, you know, we're trying to figure out how to best do this, but we're having our quarterly business meeting tonight at the end of our worship time, and I'm starting a new series and I call Spring Training. Did you know pitchers and catchers reported this week? Does anybody care? Okay, they did. Spring Training, 
And we're going to be aligning what we're doing on Sunday nights in the, in the worship time with some of the scripture that the discipleship groups are using. We're starting that tonight. And so we'll have our worship time, and then at the end of the service, we'll have our quarterly business meeting. And we've got some big stuff to deal with tonight, so I want to encourage you to be here. Um, the service starts at 6.30. We'll probably get around to the business session around 7.15 or so. So, And I know if you're in your groups, that's putting pressure on you, Chuck. I apologize for that, but just uh, get there when you can, all right? Very good. Well, I'm going to have Mike and Kathy follow me. I'm going to ask you to stand. Daniel Corley is going to have our benediction at this time. Look forward to seeing you tonight. God bless. Hey, guys. How y'all doing? Sorry I get so emotional sometimes when I get up here, but it's been a, I've had a really wonderful two days. I have just, I've felt God just flowing through me, and, and, and I praise him, and I thank you so much. I just want to share that with you. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this church, and I thank you for Tim, and I thank you for the people here. I know that I am saved because of Jesus Christ, and how glorious, I, I, I just, I'm at a loss for words, I don't know where to go, but I thank you so much. My prayer is that I will stand and live in a way that people will see you in me. I pray the people here do the same thing. I pray that I live in a way that people want what I have from you. And as we go about our week, let us live this way. Let us live for you, Jesus Christ. In your beautiful, precious name I pray. Amen.